Luke 19, verse 1. Praise the Lord. I'd like to thank Brother Vincent for the opportunity to minister tonight and uh, thank the Lord for strength to be here. Let's read. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. Everybody say little. Little. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to come that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And, Je uh, sorry, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Praise the Lord. Let's just turn over also to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. I'll say that again, little. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a drop. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not from henceforth, Thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought all their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Uh, Brother Vincent, would you, uh, would you lead in prayer to ask God's blessing on his word tonight? Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated tonight. Okay, do we have that uh, title slide, sister? All right. Praise the Lord. You man, I kind of debated on, on a title for this, and uh, I have up here, Jesus Loves the Little Guy. That's, I guess, my first, uh, my first point to you is that Jesus loves a little guy. The, uh, the, the kind of the title, rough title, is just the advantage of being little. The advantage of being little. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I've had some experience with that. I well remember the day that uh, I was about, I don't know, eight years old. And uh, you know how parents will have their child stand up to the door frame and measure them and put a little mark there? Well, 
we didn't keep a, a running tally of my growth. It was a little too discouraging, but uh, um, <laughs> my dad measured me and uh, got out the measuring tape, and I was three foot 11, and I was like, I got great big chest and my head lifted up a little higher and I thought my goodness I'm gonna make it to the Olympics someday I thought I was a track star in the making or something I don't know three foot eleven just sounded huge I don't know why but anyway uh, I remember that but there's an advantage to little things and uh, Jesus loves the little guy Jesus loves the little guy and I'm not so much speaking about stature like Zacchaeus but we'll get into the kind of little that we're, we're speaking of here tonight. But Zacchaeus is a good example from God's word. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was rich. He had all kinds of money, but the problem was he had gotten a lot of it dishonestly. He was a tax collector, and he had ripped a lot of people off. And uh, he lived with this shame inside of having kind of worked against his own people because the Romans would hire Jewish men and so forth as uh, tax collectors to go take taxes and collect them from the Jewish people in this day. But most of the time, they tacked on their own fee. They'd, they'd collect extra, not just what was due the Romans. And uh, they, they were not liked very well. So he, he, ha he was riddled with all this stuff, I'm sure inside of feeling some shame and maybe, you know, he had all that money, but he had gotten it in a, in a way that wasn't uh, so uh, admired by his neighbors and so forth. But uh, I'm sure he was torn inside a little bit, but he heard, he heard word that the great, uh, the great healer and the great teacher and this one that they were calling the son of God was making his way to Jericho and Maybe he was just feeling a bit like it was time for a change. Time for a change. Tired of having trouble sleeping at night. Tired of having trouble from maybe maybe neighbors that were resentful of the career he had chosen and different mistakes he had made. And uh, Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming. He had heard great things. Everywhere Jesus went, he healed people. So he ran down, you know, got off work early or whatever and made his way to where Jesus was going to be going up Main Street and big crowd, couldn't see through the crowd, couldn't see over the crowd. And uh, so his only solution was to climb a tree. How many knows it pays to have a hunger to touch God? It pays to have a heart that's willing to make effort to get what you need from the master. And uh, so he climbed the sycamore tree, and uh, I'm thinking that Jesus either heard people saying, you know, these nasty remarks as he came up the road and people asking to be healed, and maybe somebody called Zacchaeus by name, or maybe just because him being God manifest in the flesh, maybe he was, he just knew he was called him Zacchaeus. Or, you know, maybe he had been in Jericho a few times and had, had heard tell of him. I don't know. Either of those three could have happened. But he stopped at the base of that tree and engaged Zacchaeus in conversation. Jesus was sensitive to what people around that were hungry and humble needed. Zacchaeus was little and short. But I find also in God's word, like you do too, that Jesus had a way of finding those that didn't have it all together. And he might have appeared to be wealthy on the outside and, and living an easy life, but inside Zacchaeus was broken. And he might have had a nice, I don't know, chariot or horse to ride around in, but he was empty inside. Sin had left him empty. Choices he had made had left him empty. And uh, Zacchaeus... You know, Jesus stops, talks to him, invites him to get down and says, I'm coming to your house. And, and Zacchaeus, you know, you hear people that need to be back where they ought to be with God or they know they grew up, had an experience with God or they've heard tell of what this gospel of Jesus is about. 
a changed life and, and forgiveness and Calvary. They've heard talk of God's word, but, you know, you've heard people say if they got invited to church and you know, they wouldn't dare go because the roof would cave in on them or, you know, people talk like that, right? I've, I've heard people say that. And, uh, you know, they, they just can't bring themselves to step across the threshold of the door. I had a teacher that I worked with in St. George one time, and I had been praying for this guy, Cameron. I had been reaching out to him, and and uh, he'd come over for coffee. We'd played guitar together, and and uh, one, s one Monday I went to work, and he said, you know, Brent, he said, I drove up in the parking lot of your church yesterday when church was going on. And I was like, Really? Wow. And I had been actually, I believe, praying quite intensely one Friday or Saturday night just previous to that. Lord, save Cameron. Save him. Anyway, he, he drove up in the yard, and he just couldn't bring himself to get out of the vehicle and, and come in. But we're surrounded by people that are in two boats. Either they don't realize they need God and are broken, or they have some issues and brokenness, but they just plain think they're above that or something. It's not, they're, they're not, they're not, you know, they're, I, I, sh I don't want to use the word proud, but that's what God's word calls us. There's a pride that says we are all right on our own. I'm all right with what I have. Don't talk to me about that religious stuff. You know, uh, there's, there's, humanity that creeps in and when if we go back to luke chapter five i want to share a couple things about peter you see zacchaeus was humble enough i mean that's quite something for a rich guy to climb a tree but he wasn't arrogant he wasn't full of pretension and pretense he just needed what he needed from god and i found in my life that god is drawn to brokenness and people that are willing to just admit they really, really can't do it their way anymore. And they really ha don't have an answer for what they're facing. So in Luke chapter 5, we see another gentleman that Jesus was reaching out to. And, uh, you know, sometimes people don't want to admit, you know, that they're, they're needing help or needing prayer. But then there's others that they know who to ask for prayer. They, they know, you know, they're, they're going through something, and, and they'll reach out and say, would you please pray for me? Maybe not when people are around that are going to hear them say it. I, I've, I've worked with people. I've, uh, you've all rubbed shoulders with people that when the chips are down, they, they'll seek out a child of God and ask for prayer. And uh, I believe God honors that. And he shows himself loving, and he shows himself that he wants to work in their life, and he's willing to answer and care. Peter was a successful fisherman, Simon Peter. And Jesus came along to the edge of the lake, and uh, he challenged Peter, who had just finished his shipping, uh, fishing outing, toiled all night. He'd be tired, but Jesus said, they were in there cleaning their nets. Jesus said, you know, uh, the crowd is crowding in around me here. Do you mind if I sit in the front of your boat and teach from just a few feet into the water and then the crowd won't keep pushing in? And he probably had to keep backing up. You know, the crowd just wanted miracles and wanted healing. And he kept backing up. Well, finally, the only place to turn was the front of Peter's boat. I wonder if, well, I mean, that was by design, obviously, because God had a miracle for Peter coming. So he, he gets into the boat, sits in the front of the boat, and starts teaching again. But what he says to Peter is, thrust out a little. Thrust out a little from the land. Jesus didn't ask for a lot. When, when it's, we're in the place where we need God to do something in our life, sometimes that little step is all it takes. Sometimes a little thing is all it takes. Don't underestimate the little things. Don't underestimate the little things. You know, a, an acorn, an acorn is pretty small, but it can grow into a great oak tree. You look this time of year, I walk through the yard, and, and there's these little bushes or 
perennials and different things, tr branches with twigs and, and, and uh, so forth, just these little buds and different plants and, and so forth with just a little bud and it turns into a, a blossom, a flower, and then it bears fruit. Something so tiny can do something so great. Think of nuclear power, you know, how World War II ended with them discovering the power that was in the atom and splitting an atom and bombarding the nucleus of an atom with electrons or whatever it is. They start a chain reaction that causes a huge, they split the atom and causes a huge explosive power to be released. Little things can do great things. A little bit of willingness with God can go a long way. A little bit of, you know, Peter starting out as maybe successful and happy with his life and things are going along okay. Or Zacchaeus, you know, he's got some brokenness inside and shame and he wants a change. He's hungry for something or he wouldn't have climbed a tree. Peter, the word starts to go out. Jesus is in the front of the boat and he's teaching, so... He obeyed what Jesus said, took a little step. God's word starts to work. And anyone remember the first Bible verse that somebody shared with you? The Bible says that we are saved and born again because the word begins to work in us. We're born not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, the word of God that lives and abides forever. It's the, God does everything in our life through his word. Well, not only does Jesus love the little guys, and you're saying, Peter was a great big guy. Peter was a great big guy. Big, rugged fisherman. Well, you look down a little further here, and when the miracle happens, and hundreds of fish, and it begins to sink the two boats, because they caught so many fish after all night of not catching fish, Peter's like, okay, there's something pretty amazing going on here, that this teacher that they say is from heaven. They, there's something powerful here that he knew if we went back out and tried again, and he did a miracle. Uh, Peter probably hadn't caught that many fish at one time too many times. And he begins to realize God's working. The word is already working because he'd heard Jesus teach. And he, he's obedient at your word. I'll, I'll let down the net and so forth. So... Peter, uh, Peter's re reaction is, okay, here's this mighty miracle. This guy must be not an ordinary man. This must be God at work in this situation. This must be heaven walking amongst us. And his response is this, depart from me. I am a sinful man. I am a sinful man. It's clear in God's word that like David, David didn't get forgiveness until he humbled himself after the thing with Bathsheba. He didn't get forgiveness until Nathan stuck his finger in his face, the prophet, and said, you're the man who did this wrongdoing. And David cried out in Psalm 51, you know, purge me with hyssop, I'll be clean. Create in me a clean heart, you know, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. David knew how to cry out in repentance. Isaiah 66 says this, says uh, Isaiah 57, I'll read that first, Isaiah 57, thus saith the high and lofty one, well it doesn't get any bigger than God, there, he, he's both the ultimate, he is the ultimate, he's, there's nothing greater than him, thus saith the high and lofty one, capital O, O-N-E, the high and lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. But I also dwell, it says, with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Jesus might inhabit all of the universe, but he's also small enough, can, can fit in a small enough spot where he's in a broken heart to mend it, a heart that's open to him. Somebody who's humble, yes, Lord, I, I made a mistake, I need you. Hannah, Hannah, the mother of Samuel, she got broken before the Lord. She didn't put on any pretense. She was praying, praying so 
intensely, pouring out her heart. The, the priest thought she was drunk. She didn't hold back, and she got her miracle. She got her miracle. Small things can do great things. Uh, maybe just move on there in the slides, if you would. It's like this. Jesus told a parable in Luke 18. Luke 18, he told a parable. Two guys go up to the temple to pray. The Pharisee thought he had it all together. He stood and prayed thus with himself. It almost sounds like he thought he was so good he was almost praying to himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So he brags himself up to the Lord, but he gets nowhere. He thought he had it all together. But oftentimes when we're so sure, it's when we're actually missing God's mark. I'm not talking about doctrine. I'm not talking about things that God's word declares emphatically. But the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He just stood at the back, kept his head down. Lord, I, I really need you. I, I, I'm, I got nothing to offer. I got nothing to bargain with. I got nothing to convince you that I'm deserving of anything. I just need you, Jesus. For he, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased. He that humbleth himself shall be exalted. It says, I tell you, this man, the humble man, went down to his house justified. So there's a blessing in little things. There's a blessing in little things. Tiny things can do amazing things. Uh, let's go back to Luke 5 for a minute. I, I skipped away from it for a minute. And, sister, one more slide there, the French one. I'm going to give you a French lesson tonight. Uh, if you'd skip ahead just one slide. All right. Uh, uh, sometimes I have students that have, they're really comical. They're really comical. Um, go uh, back one, back one. Uh, I, I have students that will ask questions after a child does an oral presentation. And uh, um, <laughs> sometimes a child will maybe want to sound quite intelligent and quite informed because they've read Wikipedia and they've Googled stuff or watched YouTube. And so I, I had this little girl one time that just thought it would be really cool to throw in big words with the questions she was asking kids in response. You know, they'd get up and talk about whatever for five minutes with the PowerPoint and open it up for questions after. And, you know, you know the type, right? They try to sound, someone tries to sound a little impressive. And uh, But you know the reaction that causes in the people around, right? The people that are paying attention and are like, got their discernment turned up enough. It's like, oh, brother, here she goes again, or... Oh, brother, here he goes again, trying to show off, right? Like that's, that's kind of because the Bible says he that exalts himself will be abased. God, God delights in humility. He delights in people not thinking more of themselves than they ought to think, like Romans 12 says. <laughs> so uh, he, he's just looking for a small, honest prayer. He's just looking for, you know, if you're away from God or have never experienced him, he's just looking for an honest heart. Zechariah 4.10 says, Who hath despised the day of small things? Jesus said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed. So uh, this is what Peter said. A sin, he, he said, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm not worthy to be around you. I'm, he said he was a sinful man. I was reading it in my French Bible, and he called himself Um. Peshel, Am Peshel, called himself a, a sinner, a, a guy who sins, or a sinner man, or a sinful man. And then I read down a little bit further where Jesus answered. And if you put that slide up, I think it's the next one. Jesus said, don't worry about being an Am Peshel. He says, I know there's a change going on in you right now. And look at the word there for fisher of men. Peshel, just a slight different French accent on the E. 
One is called accent aigu, going up like this, and the one on the second pêcheur means fisher or fisherman, and it's got a little hat thing on it, a little upside down V that's called circonflex. Just that little slight change, little difference. It didn't take a big thing for Peter. It was a very small thing. He just humbled himself. And what did Jesus do with Peter? It was a starting point, that little change. Lord, I'm sinful. I'm not worthy of your blessings. I'm not worthy of this two boats full of fish. And Jesus said, don't worry about you being unworthy. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Just a little difference. And I, I thought that was neat. Sorry, I, I'm a French teacher. You've got to forgive me. Just that little tiny thing. Prior to it, he was sinner. After that encounter, he went on his way being transformed to share the gospel, to reach souls, to heal and, and uh, minister. All right, let's, uh, let's move on from that. Jesus loves the underdog. Jesus loves the underdog. He delights in the underdog, I believe. There's a story of Rudy. Uh, what was his name? Rudy Rudiger. He was the uh, Notre Dame football player. Sat on the bench, sat on the bench, wanted to play football. He was not really, he didn't quite make the starting lineup for a long time. And then got just pushed into a, an end of a game in a playoff, I believe it was. And, uh, you know, the crowd was the crowd was chanting, Rudy, Rudy, bring him in. So the underdog comes in. He had sat on the bench and kept it warm for a couple of seasons maybe. And uh, he ends up making two dramatic plays that help Notre Dame win. And he, he got his name on uh, the game record or some, something along that line. I'm not a big football guy, but I, I do know enough of that story. To but he was an underdog. God loves... What doth the Lord require of thee? Micah 6 and 8 says, What does God require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? I used to, I used to think it was important to grow tall. And uh, I used to think it was a great advantage to growing tall. And then reality hit, and all my hockey player friends kept growing, and I didn't, and I spent more time getting knocked down on the ground. And Spent more time on the ice, I mean, not the ground, but the ice. and It seemed like a great disadvantage to be small. In sports, it's, it doesn't seem to be an advantage. But then, you know, as I realized, some people just have that gift in their life of being tall. At least I don't have to worry when I walk through a doorway that I'm going to bump my head, right? Like, there's advantages to being small. I know s some folks like that Paul Richard fellow that was around here a few years ago. I think he had to duck every time he went under a doorway. Like, there's advantages. There's advantages. God favors the heart that is humble. The way up with God is down. A broken and contrite heart he will not despise. Now, just moving on here. Just one more uh, slide there, I think. Oh. Jesus loves the little guy. He loves the little ones. The term little ones is all through the five books at the start of the Bible. Little ones, little ones, little ones. And uh, if you've been blessed to work with kids, you know there's a special blessing when a child speaks something to do with God. And I remember, I remember a few years ago, I was going through a situation at work since moving here, and it's, I had a different principle back then, but I faced a stress with a co-worker at that time where it seemed like I was being talked about and I was going to face a tough situation and maybe get called in to answer for something. And I walked out of the hallway and into my class, and uh, Anthony Boyd was in my class at that time, and I was like just intensely upset inside about a situation that was materializing and I saw what was coming down the road later that day for a meeting or something I can't quite recall but I walked in and Anthony walked up to my desk with this yellow piece of paper and uh, on, uh, I don't know I hadn't said a word nothing and uh, on the piece of paper he had written uh, something about keep praising him anyhow. 
keep praising him anyhow, something along that line. And I think he might have read a little Bible verse or something there, and he handed it to me, and I looked at it. And the Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, God can ordain strength. And that little card from Anthony at that moment was just what I needed to know that God had my back at that time. It was powerful. How many, okay, one more slide there. God loves the little ones, and this goes along with this. The little things can be used by God. Little things can be used by God right there. Uh, one more. Little things can be used by God as a source of encouragement. You ever read that phrase in the book of Psalms, his loving kindness, because his loving kindness is better than life, our lips will praise him, or uh, it talks about God's tender mercies, God's tender mercies. God, the little things in life can be little glimpses to me of God's love at just the right time. Little things can be just what we needed. I remember, uh, I remember different times over the years, being being stressed or just things happening, and that'd be the day that I'd walk into school and a student would, I don't know, ha have a, a picture they'd made or they would give me a gift, an actual gift. Just like, oh, Mr. Bond, we just wanted you to have this, you know, br bring me a coffee or something in the morning. Or just be out on the playground supervising. A lot going on, a lot of pressures. Adults have that at times. We go through those seasons. And a uh, little kid would just come up and, and talk to you for a few minutes as you're walking around on the playground. Yeah, Sister McAllister, you know what I mean. When a child just is sensitive and, and the Lord just brings them alongside. You know, maybe they reach out and give you a little hug in the hallway or just something. They make a little comment. Oh, you're my favorite EA or just whatever. And those little things can be a source of encouragement along the way. Just little things. Like maybe, you know, well, mother-in-law has brought my favorite sugar-free pop at times. And, and it's like, oh, okay, just a little... You know, maybe to them it's nothing. Somebody brings you chocolate at just the right time. And, and I don't mean on a, a, a special occasion. I just mean, you know, oh, I picked up this Hershey bar for you. I hope that's anyone, – anyone connect with that one? Sorry. Maybe, maybe nobody likes chocolate. It's okay. Sorry, you better repent. If you, don't, if you don't acknowledge that one, you better repent and make it right. <coughs> Conviction is in the house. But I've seen over and over again those little tender mercies of the Lord. He's so good. He's so good. He'll do those little things when we're at a point of need. When we're at a point of need. Like Mary was in the garden just weeping, weeping after, you know, she went. And, and it looked like somebody had taken the body of Jesus after he rose again. And she didn't understand what was happening. But the Lord went to her and was in the garden and knew just what she needed, just what she needed to get through that situation. And he spoke to her, said her name. You might lay awake at night and worry or stress. Maybe it's a financial need. And God does these little things. And sometimes they're not really little. They're huge. Because at the time, you know it's God when it seems huge, but it might be small. And other times, it's just he meets a need. I remember at times voicing to the Lord, this amount of money, Lord, really would be helpful to meet such and such. And by the day's end, someone brought that amount exactly to us. Little things the Lord does can let you know. I was driving home from youth convention. These miracles and these little situations came to me on my way to church tonight and last night driving with Isaiah and Madison to go see my dad, I just felt to encourage him with a couple stories, testimonies. And uh, the story is told of Brother Chad LeKing uh, that we knew down in Charlotte County, and he preached at Campobello, and he told how his dad was driving through the tunnels in Montreal under the St. Lawrence River, those big highway tunnels, three or four lanes each way, huge tunnels. And his dad, a few years back, was driving through one of these tunnels 
And all of a sudden, the engine started going, rah, 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 and the sh car was shaking, and he had to slow right down, slow right down. You know, it's heavy traffic. If you've driven through Toronto or Montreal or Chicago, Boston, huge traffic. It's like hang on to the wheel and like don't cause any road rage. Like just use your signal light and all this. Well, the engine, rah, 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 and it slowed, slow. He had to slow down. He was worried it might break down, and he prayed, and it, it went on for like a minute or two. And those tunnels were quite long. He got up just to the end of the tunnel after, no, sorry. It went on for a minute or two, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. Well, and then he sped up again and went on his way. And coming out of the tunnel, there was a huge accident. There in the lanes he was pa traveling in. And he testified that, he, he reflected on it, he said, my goodness. If I hadn't had to slow down for that, what seemed like a minute or two, and drive slow, thinking the car was going to break down, he, he said, I might have been right in the middle of that car crash. Anyone know what I'm talking about? And he said he believed God had just sent an angel to stick a sword down in that under that hood and mess up the engine for a few minutes just to protect him and spare him. I was driving home from youth convention uh, um, one night. We were living in Blacks Harbor, and you pull off the highway at Penfield, and you drive about eight minutes off the highway to where we lived. And it was late. And uh, just off the highway, going down the Blacks Harbor Road, just a couple hundred yards, I had to stop. I, and, and the headlights coming toward me, I saw the silhouettes of a family of uh, porcupines crossing the road, a mother and three or four babies. And I said, oh, man, uh, I'm tired, just want to get home, I slow down, stop, had to wait. It must have taken, you know, they don't walk fast, they kind of waddle. Uh, so anyway, I, I just wait, anyway, so they carried on, they crossed the road, and I don't value porcupines a lot, but I just didn't feel like hitting them. So. Anyway, I drive further down the road, and I get to a place called the Farm Stretch. And there's a road that comes in at a T called the Mountain Road from Beaver Harbor. And I see these headlights ahead, a few hundred yards. These headlights are flying toward the road I'm on. And they have a stop, and I have the right of way, of course, because uh, my road doesn't even slow down. And they're but they're not slowing down for the stop sign. Noticeably, in any way, they look like they're flying out of control. <laughs> and the car comes cr careening around the turn way into my lane. And I'm back, like, I'm back a few hundred yards. And then zooms around, like, just all over the road. And I'm like, wow. I'm glad I wasn't, and then it hit me. Lord, you put those porcupines in my way at that time to preserve my life. And there was a young man just a few weeks later that came out to church a few times, and he had been my student, and I told him that story, and he said, Mr. Bond, I feel goosebumps all over me. God, God does this kind of thing for his people when we're walking with him. And and uh, we we just mentioned one more miracle like that. We were coming through Chris Pam on our way, like nine, ten, twelve years ago, living down in Charlotte County, coming up to s probably see Ethel. Probably I don't know. I imagine we, that's what our trip to Norton was about at that time, uh, or someone up this way, probably mother-in-law. But anyway. We stop at the drive-through where House of Chan and the Express McDonald's is and all that, little Irving, Circle K Irving and SO and all that. And we stop there. And the drive-through takes at the coffee shop. It was normally like this. I mean, back then there was such a thing as fast food. It, fast food's gone now. But um, it, the normally the drive-through was like that. And it took a good three or four minutes, it seemed, or more, maybe five, to get through that drive-thru. I don't know what it took. I was a little frustrated. Got back on the highway, finally. And just up by that trailer park, mini home park, 
on the four lane heading toward Hampton. We just came up by where the exit goes off for Hammond River. And on the other side of the four lane where the lane merges from Hammond River onto the four lane, there was a pile up of cars, a big truck in the ditch and, and laying right on the shoulder by where we were driving by who had been ejected from a vehicle was a man across the edge of the pavement lying face down or on his back and we found out later he died in that accident. He had been ejected from his vehicle, flew across the median, landed there. And it, w it was quite a crash. Now, if we hadn't got held up, we m I don't know. I can't say for sure. I don't have a TikTok video to prove it. But if, if we had a not got held up and been right there, there could have easily been a car swerve into us to get away from that flying body of the man who was either dead or dying. And once again, you see the hand of the Lord like, we serve a good God, and he looks after his children, and he's a heavenly father that cares. He's a heavenly father that wants to show us day by day big, thi big ways and small ways that he cares for us and also that he wants to use us. And I've seen over and over again miracles. You've seen miracles. You've lived those stories. But maybe for someone on the live stream tonight, I just felt impressed to share. God will step into our everyday laneways and hallways and rooms we're in, and he will bring his peace or his protection or his healing, his provision, his goodness, his love to show us once again that he cares enough about what goes on in our life that he's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. He's going to provide, the song says, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. Well, I remember, I remember uh, different times in my life I'd have to have a talk with the Lord and say, Lord, you know, I, I was wrong in this area. I was wrong. But knowing how to repent, knowing how, not knowing how as if you learn a method, but having a heart that is willing to respond to God when he grants us the opportunity to repent, that is such a key because he says he won't despise a broken and contrite heart. He will meet us at our point of need. And oftentimes, it's just that one-word prayer, that one-word prayer, Jesus. Janet went to visit friends when she was about 17 and a half, maybe 18, had just been driving for a little while, and she went out in the winter to visit friends from Norton. She, she drove out to, like, cars or somewhere way out there and uh, stayed for a while, and the snowstorm came up, and I might have told this before, but let's all stand. Uh, she went out to visit, a f hang out with a friend, storm came up she stayed longer maybe than you know being a teenager stayed longer than maybe a lot of us experienced drivers would uh, if we know icy roads and the snow began to pile up and she said well it might be time to get back home she started heading home and uh, the roads the snow was piling up on the roads and there's a hill there uh, coming down toward the Blau Bay, the Blau, the bay is like this, just around the corner from the ferry and uh, coming in from cars and Wickham. And there's a road that goes like an angle like this and then a sharp hairpin turn back this way and there's a little cemetery there. But she was heading downhill toward the Blau Bay and her car just started to spin like this, just 180. And she, uh, you know, the one word prayer, Jesus. Jesus. It's all she had time for. And uh, I just feel in the Holy Ghost that somebody needs to know that Jesus will answer just an honest cry. It doesn't have to be a big prayer, you know. You don't have to make yourself good to get God. You don't have to, you don't have to perfect everything or come with all your eyes dotted and T's crossed. Just come with a heart that's like, yes, Lord, I... 
I'm tired of doing it my way. I'm, I'm willing to do it your way. My way hasn't worked. Jesus, I need you. I hear, I hear that you're able to save me, Jesus. I hear that you're able to do great things if I'll walk with you and obey you, give my life to you. And if you'll pray that kind of prayer, Jesus, just show me how real you are. Show me that you're real like these folks say you are. If what that guy with the microphone is saying is, is true about how you want to be involved in my life, Jesus, just show me that you're real, that you care. How many in the house tonight will believe, believe that God answers an honest cry from a heart that's broken? He answers a cry. He did it for me when my life was broken and battered and bruised. And he met me at my point of need. He'll do it for you tonight. And he, he makes a way through what Jesus did for us at the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again. If we'll turn from our sin, turn our life over to God. We're going this way. We need to turn, repent, turn away from sin, turn toward God. And say, Lord, your word tells me if I'll be baptized in the name of Jesus to wash away my sin for the forgiveness and remission of sin, you'll give me the gift of the Holy Ghost. And I believe just about everybody in the house tonight has experienced that miracle. It's more important than your body being healed. It's more important than anything else. But God also delights to do those other things. He delights to do it when we're at the end of our rope, or he delights to do it with just that simple little change. A little change. It's just changing from God, no, to Jesus, yes. God, yes, I will. From I won't to I will. It's just a little thing, and he'll show you miracles.